Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. And if you could stand, we'll begin in prayer. Us, it is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. And make us worthy, O Master, to deal with confidence and without condemnation, to call upon you as a Heavenly Father, and to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the communion of the Holy Spirit may be upon you, help you, and protect you at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. God bless you. It's uh, wonderful to be back here at St. John's after so much time away. I think the last time we came here was five years ago. But uh, I want to thank Father Pollard for inviting us back and also all the parishioners here at St. John's, I want to begin by simply saying that when we place ourselves in the hands of God, when we trust in the Lord, it is amazing what He can do through us. Maybe each one of us feels like, oh, I can't accomplish a lot. But when we place ourselves in the hands of God, it's Christ Himself who accomplishes things. We started here at St. John's in a little room up there, but we have grown not only in, the, uh, in attendance, but also grown in the number of programs we have been offering by the grace of God and by the trust of faith that the faithful attendees had way back then. When I turned to you after, what, three, four years of being together and for the first time said, I need your help financially. And you stepped forward not knowing where we were going, but the Lord prospered the work of our hands When we trust in Him, it is amazing what He can do through us. Okay, we've got our work cut out for us today. Our plan is this. I'm going to give some opening remarks, which unfortunately turned out to be eight pages. Um, But then I have for you a 6th century text. I know that many of you are wondering. We know we celebrate the Feast of the Assumption of the Mother of God in the East called the Dormition, of the mother of God, the falling asleep. But how do we know this happened besides the fact that Pius XII declared it as a dogma of the church? Well, guess what? Pius XII didn't invent the feast of the Assumption, the reality of the Assumption of the mother of God. It is a tradition which goes back to the earliest days of the church. And so I have for us a 6th century text that we will read through. I have copies of it for you. I trimmed it down some so that we can fit it in tonight, but we are going to start with some general comments, and then hopefully, if we have time, get to that text. If we don't have time, then, uh, then I'll hand it out to you for your way home. We posted all of these on our event page, all of the references I'll be making tonight. I have a number of articles I'll be referring to so that you can look them up as we go. I'll begin by reading you a paragraph which I wrote because I wanted to make sure I got it right. I have enemies on all sides this evening. First, from our Protestant brothers and sisters who are here tonight to see me, a Catholic, squirm and try to tease out of the Bible a biblical reference for them on the Assumption of Mary. I will do that for you. Second, among our many Roman Catholics here tonight who know that I am not Roman Catholic but Melkite Greek Catholic and as such hold to the Orthodox theology on this issue which is very clear, that Mary did indeed undergo bodily death, a point contended by many pious and well-meaning Catholics. 
And finally, I know that we have a few of our Orthodox brothers and sisters here with us tonight who are here to see what a so-called unit has to say for himself, especially in regards to the Roman Catholic tradition that Mary spent her final days on earth, not in Jerusalem, as the Orthodox tradition holds, but in Ephesus. In other words, I am standing in a war zone, and I will offend every single person in this room, surely, at some point tonight, but I am Sicilian, and that's why I chose my topic this evening. <laughs> so first, our Protestant brothers and sisters, I will lay aside the detailed argument about where, when, how, and why for the moment, well, maybe not the why, but the where and when, and discuss that in a few moments, the debate between the East and the West on this issue, because I think the issue that we face with our Protestant brothers and sisters is more fundamental, a fundamental problem. Obviously, we don't have all night to deal with the uh, apologetic issues that surround the issue of the Assumption, the doctrine of the Assumption, but I do want to consider just a few points and give you an arrow if you would like to continue to pursue the question further. The problem that I believe, anyways, most Protestants have with the doctrine of the Assumption revolves around two issues. First of all, and I think you all know this very well, the error called sola scriptura. The error called sola scriptura. I will read you a quotation I found online as a definition of sola scriptura only because I want to make sure I get it right, and I think it's a pretty fair and conservative analysis that doesn't go too far with the doctrine. And it says this, Sola Scriptura is a doctrine that the Bible contains all knowledge necessary for salvation and holiness. Consequently, Sola Scriptura demands only those doctrines are to be admitted or confessed that are found directly within or indirectly by using valid logic deduction or valid deductive reasoning from Scripture. However, Sola Scriptura is not a denial of other authorities governing Christian life and devotion, Rather, it simply demands that all other authorities are subordinate to and are to be corrected by the written word of God. Sounds all right, for the most part. Okay? And I chose that because I think it's a, at least it's the closest thing you could find to a Catholic, the Catholic doctrine. I have no problem with the scriptures making sure we're staying in track with our theology. But as we know as Catholics, there are other things which also keep us in track with our theology and not only scripture, not sola scriptura. Oftentimes, this doctrine is set out in contrast to the church's teaching, claiming that the church's teaching is what was condemned by Christ as the traditions of men in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, verse 7. The traditions of men. This is an erroneous step. I would say that anyone that wants to take this step is committing intellectual suicide. Why? Because simply, Jesus Christ was alive and walking on this earth far before the Roman Catholic Church ever existed. He was not talking to Roman Catholics. He was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He was talking to the Jews of his time. And so you cannot, therefore, simply make the leap and apply his teachings as a condemnation of the teachings of the Catholic Church. Okay? You have to understand who he was talking to, what he was talking about in its context. I point you, because of time, to an article that my brother wrote and is posted on our website for the event page for this event. My brother's article on Sola Scriptura. It's about three or four pages. Obviously, a little more than I can get into tonight. Make sure you go there and read that article. But I do want you to remember that the vast majority of the Old Testament was handed down orally prior to it being written down, and a good part of the New Testament also. Oral tradition is a part of the patrimony of the church, and the people alive at the time of Christ understood this intimately. 
We can see it. For those, you, who brought their Bibles with them tonight? Look at that. I love it. Catholics, beautiful. Open your Bibles. Let's take a couple looks just very quickly at, uh, where's my Bible? <laughs> it's over there. Real quick at the Gospel of John. For those that are familiar with basic apologetic arguments, you're already going to be familiar with these texts. But I think it warrants just a quick look. Take a look at John chapter 21, verse 25. When John is finished, completely finished, writing his gospel, look at what he says. There are also many other things which Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. In other words, John has just spent three years of his life following this man. His life has been fundamentally changed. And he says, I can't, there's no way I can write all the things which I saw. So there are other things that Jesus did which are not contained in the gospel text. Take a look at 2 John. Where is 2 John? Go to the book of Revelation and go backwards. 2 John, verse 12. There is no chapter. If you've never read this epistle, my dear friends, it would take you about 30 seconds. Verse 12. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink, but I hope to come to see you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. This is absolutely an important text. And he says the identical thing if you just want to write it down in 3 John verse 13. You can always remember that. 2 John verse 12, 3 John verse 13. Okay? Why is this so important? Because we here in America, in a post-Protestant world, have been inundated, being beaten over the head with the idea that the written Word of God is the sole authority. And I think as Catholics, we cower. But look at what John says, and I think you would understand this. Would you prefer to write a note to somebody, or would you prefer to talk to them face-to-face if you had something important to tell them? I face this every day when I'm writing emails. I'm sure you do too. Some people love to write emails. I hate writing emails. So people will write me an email, and what do I do? Or they'll text me. Oh, that's the worst. Have you ever tried to type on one of these phones? They're terrible. Anyways, so what do I do? I call them back so that we can actually talk. And then they don't answer. Okay. Even more so face-to-face. John understood this, and John was living in a biblical context. This wasn't true just for John. He wasn't running around holding a Bible saying, every word I write you are to receive as the word of God inspired by God. No, he was inspired by God, yes. But as he was writing, he did not expect, I don't think, for us to bind them in beautiful binding, not that this is all that, with beautiful jeweled gold books. No. In fact, when he had something important to say, when he had something essential to say about the faith, he didn't write it down. He went and spoke it to them face to face, and they handed it on orally. The most important things. Take a look with me at 2 Thessalonians. Just go back a few epistles, you'll find it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 15. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught by us, either by word of mouth or by letter or epistle. Okay? You know this text well, Catholics, I'm sure. There are two ways in which we receive the teachings of our fathers. By epistle, what is written down, thank you, John, in First and Second and Third John. And by word of mouth, thank you, John, in Second and Third John, saying he's going to come and speak handing on what Christ taught them, both orally and written. Both orally and written. Second, it is necessary to remember that there is nowhere in the Bible that says the Bible and the Bible alone is the sole authority for doctrines of the faith. It itself, Luther's doctrine of sola scriptura, is refuted by Scripture itself. It is a self-refuting doctrine. The doctrine is not taught in the very thing which he says must be the foundation for what we believe. 
It is a self-refuting doctrine. And therefore, it is, as Luther would claim about the teachings of the church, simply a tradition of men. It is that. It is not the Word of God. And it is not the orthodox teaching of the church. A second major error that I believe is even more fundamental to our subject of the assumption tonight, more important than the question of sola scriptura, is Luther's understanding of grace as a reality to be found in God alone. For Luther, and even more for Calvin, grace was not something that entered into man as the life of God shared with man. It was not a reality which justified man from the inside out and rectified us, set us in order, made us sons of God in reality by participation in divine life. Rather, grace for Luther and Calvin and the Protestant reformers or revolutionaries was something to be found in God and God alone. Luther looked at himself, a sinner, and he said, look, I continually sin. He was scrupulous, overly scrupulous. Some accounts said he went to confession many, many times a day while he was still a monk. Many times a day. He became overly scrupulous and looking at himself said, look, my baptism hasn't done anything for me. Confession isn't doing anything for me. Therefore, this idea of grace justifying man interiorly must be wrong. Grace and justification and ultimately sanctification is not something that affects man internally, but is a changing on God's part to look at man, a sinner, corrupt, and to place in front of him Jesus Christ. So that the Father would look at us, corrupted, sinful man, and instead of seeing you and seeing me, he would see his Son and change his mind about his judgment on us. So the famous saying goes, man is a pile of dung covered in snow. Left in his sin and corruption, but as Dr. Marshner loves to say, I don't think he's ever said it at the Institute. Dr. Marshner says, you want to understand grace for Luther? Grace is the smiley face on God. He changes his decision. He changes his judgment about man. Imagine this. A murderer walks into the courtroom. The trial goes on. The judge declares him innocent and free to go. Does that change the reality that the man is a murderer? No. He remains a murderer, and yet he's given freedom to go. If you want to understand Luther's perspective on grace and justification, I think that's the best way to see it. The judge places in front of us a mirage or a cover, and that cover is Jesus Christ. And looking at Jesus Christ, and through Jesus Christ, eventually at us who he never sees, he begins to smile. And allows now corrupted man to enter into the place of incorruption, heaven itself. I say this is the most fundamental, more important than sola scriptura, because it touches upon the question of our salvation. Intimately upon the question of our salvation. And I need to remind you, and mostly for our Protestant brothers and sisters, a fundamental point. Now, I also don't want to forget that I have posted on our website two articles which I wrote on salvation that deals with this subject maybe a little more clearly. So you can get on there and you can download that article and read it. I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. He who does not love, does not know God. For God is love. You've heard this text before. God is love. How can John say God is love? Simply this, that love by its very nature seeks to communicate itself with another. Right? A husband and a wife that love each other want to share their life together, 
We say that in marriage, two become one flesh. We say that in baptism, two also become one flesh. We are joined to Jesus Christ. St. Paul said, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Because God has shared his life with us. We are his hands and his feet. God is love from all eternity. Because from all eternity, the Father has poured out his life into the Son in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Trinity has lived a life of communion of love from all eternity. We are made in the image and likeness of God. And God loves us. You say, why? Well, I got that, Deacon Sabatino. What does it have to do with the assumption of the mother of God? Well, I'll tell you what it has to do with the assumption of the mother of God. God desires to share his life with us. Really share his life with us. It's not just funny words. Really to make us partakers in the divine nature. To give us life, which is proper to God alone. And God's life, and God's life alone is immortal. And when we share that life of God, we also gain immortality. God does not want us to die, either in our spirit or in our body. God is not the author of death, and He does not desire the death of His saints. We confess in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the, of sin. the, resurrection, of the, body. the resurrection of the body. And I don't ever forget about it. God is going to raise us up bodily. Ideas of us floating in outer space without a body for all eternity. Does that sound boring to you? It sounds boring to me because that's not what God made us for. God made us to walk, to have hands, ears, eyes. I look forward to seeing you all in heaven, to giving you a hug, a real hug, to hold you, to hold hands, to look into our eyes and remember that we were here tonight together. God made us this way that we would have our bodies forever. This is important for two reasons. First of all, because we need to realize that the doctrine of the assumption or dormition of the mother of God is normal. It may not be common today, but it is normal. It is what God planned, not just for the mother of God, but for all of us, that our bodies will not remain in the tomb, but that they will go to their eternal reward and be rejoined to our soul that we may walk in heaven with our bodies and speak with each other and speak with God and see Him. That was God's plan. Not for us to go floating around in outer space. Second, we need to realize that God really wants to share His life with us. Too often I speak with our Protestant brothers and sisters who say that all of this doctrine about Mary and the saints, doesn't that take away from the glory of God? And I respond every time that you missed the point about God's love for us. You missed the point about what God plans for our salvation. God's glory is not found in selfishness. God's glory is found in His love, and love seeks to share itself with another. God wants us to live forever and to be glorified. St. Irenaeus says, the glory of God is man fully alive. The glory of God, that's a pretty awesome thing. The glory of God is man fully alive. God's glory is not found in his hoarding of himself, but in his sharing of himself. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, God, infinitely perfect and blessed in Himself, in a plan of sheer goodness, freely created man to share in His own blessed life. That is the fundamental teaching of the Catholic Church. God freely created us for one reason, to share His life with us. And when we receive the life of God, death is destroyed. 
It is no more. It cannot exist when God's life fully comes into us. Okay. I would like to bring our section here on, uh, regarding our Protestant brothers and sisters and this teaching to a close by opening our Bibles. That's a good place to go. So, yes, we are opening our Bibles to discuss the assumption of the Mother of God. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. Am I yelling too much? Oh, Ugh. I think I am. I apologize. I'm not angry. I promise. All right, Genesis chapter 5, verse 21. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah. Is it a good thing to walk with God? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Very interesting. God took him. What does that mean? Well, guess what? Our Bibles tell us what that means. If you turn with me to the epistle to the Hebrews, almost to the end of your Bible, go to the book of Revelation, work your way backwards. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Enoch didn't die. Enoch didn't die in his body or in his spirit. Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found. And he was not found. Have you ever seen a soul? No. Have you ever seen a body? Yeah, you find bodies, don't you? He wasn't found. He didn't die. He was assumed into heaven. Number one. Second Kings chapter two, you know the story of Elijah. Elijah was what? He was taken into heaven. Body and soul taken into heaven. Deuteronomy chapter 34 verse 6 tells us that when Moses died, he was buried. Huh? But that his burial site has not been found to this day. Why? Why? Because there is a tradition among the Jews that Moses, after he died and was buried, was assumed... His body was assumed into heaven. And where do you see that? In the epistle to Jude. Turn to your book of Revelation and just back. One little tiny epistle right there. Jude verses is even shorter. This is 24 verses in Jude. You've got to read this. Verse 8. Yet in like manner, these men in their dreamings defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile glorious ones. Who's Jude writing against, by the way? The Gnostics who denied the value of the flesh and the possibility of the bodily resurrection. So Jude goes to this very point about Moses. See, they dream means defile the flesh, reject authority, and revile glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, the Lord rebuke you. When Moses was buried, Michael the archangel met the devil and fought with him over the body of Moses. And who do you think won? Okay. Who showed up at the transfiguration bodily? Moses and Elijah. Two people that were assumed into heaven by tradition. huh? If you've got a problem with the assumption of the mother of God... You don't have a problem with the Catholic Church. You have a problem with the Bible. The assumption of the saints is normal. It may not be common today, but it is the norm. And God will have the last say when all of our bodies come out of the tomb and the saints are bodily taken into heaven. Okay, enough about that. Mary, and I'm going to go fast now, guys. Did she die or was she taken into heaven without dying? What say ye? What say ye? <laughs> Many, I believe, with a pious heart, try to defend that Mary did not die. Okay, why? Because of the doctrine that she was without sin. 
and without original sin, and therefore would not have the effects of original sin, one being death. I will read you from Dr. Ludwig Ott, who, don't mess with Dr. Ludwig Ott when it comes to dogmatic theology, okay? It says, Freedom from original sin does not necessarily involve freedom from all defects which came into the world as a punishment of sin. Mary, like Christ himself, was subject to general human defects, insofar as these involve no moral imperfections of acting. Okay? So could Jesus stub his toe? Possible. Was it possible for Mary to die? Yes. Yes. And in fact, the entire tradition of the church from the earliest days has held that Mary indeed did die. And this is held not only in the teachings of the fathers, but also in the liturgical texts of the church, which I have and I'll share with you during Q&A if you would like. Okay? But I will read you a quotation from Pope John Paul II. It is true that in Revelation, death is presented as a punishment for sin. However, the fact that the church proclaims Mary free from original sin by a unique divine privilege does not lead to the conclusion that she also received physical immortality. The mother is not superior to the son who underwent death, giving it a new meaning and changing it into a means of salvation. Involved in Christ's redemptive work and associated in his saving sacrifice, Mary was able to share in his suffering and death for the sake of humanity's redemption. What Severus of Antioch says about Christ also applies to her. Without a preliminary death, how could the resurrection have taken place? To share in Christ's resurrection... Mary had first to share in his death. And here Pope John Paul II is following, as I said, the entire tradition of the church. Are there fathers of the church, saints along the way, who said, was it possible for Mary to not have undergone death? There are, but the vast majority teaching of the church says that yes, indeed, she did die. Did she die in Jerusalem or did she die in Ephesus? How many of you have ever heard that she died in Ephesus? Okay, now... We're going to clarify a couple things here with you, my dear friends. The idea that Mary died in Ephesus was a 19th century teaching. No one in the Catholic or Orthodox tradition, as far as we know, claimed that Mary died in Ephesus prior to the 19th century. It is a result of the vision of Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, who, in her visions, while she lay for 12 years on her sickbed, wrote down in detail visions she was receiving. Be aware, my friends, nothing against Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, but these are private revelations. And private revelations by the teachings of the church are private. She believed that Mary died in Ephesus. May God bless her. But prior to that, there were 19 centuries contradicting that. And we will take a look at some of that evidence here in a minute. So, various accounts are retained in the church prior to the 19th century. All the way back to the 6th century, which we'll have a chance hopefully to take a look at today. The 5th century, the 4th century, and even the 3rd century. Among these early traditions, there are two strains of the story. One beginning in Bethlehem, where Mary was living before she was miraculously brought to Jerusalem for her death and eventual burial. The other tradition, the Jerusalem tradition, begins the story in Jerusalem itself, where she is living in the home of St. John on Mount Sion. Now, for those of you that have been to Mount Sion, realize that this is one of the hills of Jerusalem, one of the upper hills of Jerusalem, and there today is the Roman Catholic Abbey of the Dormition. The basic story goes like this. Mary was going to the tomb of Christ, the place of the sepulcher, the place of the resurrection every day. The Jews saw her going and her attendants with her complained to the high priest, asking him to intervene and prevent her from coming. He asked the soldiers who were guarding the tomb whether they had seen her coming day after day, and they said they had not. The story tells us that they were blinded when she approached and could not see the mother of God approaching the tomb of her son. She prayed there. Uh, I believe it's two years after the ascension. 
that she would be reunited to her son. And there the angel Gabriel appeared to her as he had appeared at the Annunciation, announcing to her that in a few days she would be brought to heaven. She prayed that the apostles would be gathered together, and they were, miraculously, from the four corners of the earth as they were doing missionary work, were brought to Jerusalem, all except for one, Thomas, who had been late to see Christ, was also missing there to be with the mother of God. The story tells us that she then died on Mount Sion. Her body was wrapped and taken by the apostles, coming down into the Kidron Valley, followed by the Jews who had complained to the high priest. One Jew ran up to the funeral fire and went to try to knock it over. When he did this, his arms got cut off and detached from his body. And he repented as his arms hung from the body of the mother of God. He repented. St. Peter interceded for him and he was restored to health. He converted and was baptized. Thomas, being late after the burial had taken place, came and asked to see the body of the mother of God when the tomb was opened. It was empty with a beautiful fragrance that came out. He received a vision of Christ who told him what had happened. This story has come down to us from the third century, written, which means, my dear friends of oral tradition, that it most likely existed prior to its writing. In fact, if the story is true, the story existed from the day in which Our Lady was taken into heaven. For those that would doubt the story of the Assumption of the Mother of God as a late medieval story, a fanciful story, I would like to point out a very interesting fact. It was the custom of the early Christians to keep safe the bones of the holy martyrs of God. We have been together to study the story of St. Polycarp and St. Ignatius. I will read you only from St. Ignatius. That after he was eaten by lions, only the harder portions of his holy remains were left, which were conveyed to Antioch. This is written in about 115 A.D. Conveyed to Antioch, wrapped in linen as an inestimable treasure left to the Holy Church by the grace which was in the martyrs. I will not read you Polycarp's story for time. The relics of the apostles have always been guarded by the church. St. John the Baptist, St. Anne, St. Joseph. We have relics of St. Paul, fragments of the Holy Cross. These are the pride of the Catholic Church, which has been in existence from the time of Christ. And from that time, we have built massive, unbelievable, enormous monuments around these bones from St. Peter to St. James in Santiago, to St. Mark's in Venice, in the year 8, what is it, 828, something like that, when the Venice merchants raided Alexandria and stole the bones of St. Mark, they took it to Venice, and that's the building they built around the dead bones of a saint. The bones of the holy people are the glory of the church. Why do I say this? Because... Not one Orthodox Christian has ever, neither in the 6th century, the 5th century, the 4th century, the 3rd century, the 1st century, ever dared to claim to have the bones of the Mother of God. Not one. And if you had them, my dear friends, every Christian would flock there. They never, not one person, ever claimed them. St. Epiphanius in the 4th century says that she died a natural death. In that case, she fell asleep in glory and departed in purity and received the crown of her virginity. Or say she was slain with a sword according to Simeon's prophecy. There her glory is with the martyrs. And she through whom the divine light shone upon the world is in the place of bliss with her sacred body. 4th century. Now, We've got 10 minutes to read four pages. You think we can do it? We'll try. 
This is a treasure, my friends, because as a 6th century Greek text, it is based upon an earlier 5th century text, which itself is based upon a 4th century text, which I have here with me. I'm not using it because this is a summary of the earlier text. And it's a, a faithful rendering of it. So it's a little easier for us to read. I've also made a few edits to it. I need a copy myself. <laughs> as the all-glorious mother of God and ever-Virgin Mary, as was her wont, was going to the holy tomb of our Lord to burn incense, and bending her holy knees, she was insistent that Christ our God, who had been born of her, should return to her. And the Jews, seeing her lingering by the divine sepulcher, came to the chief priest, saying, Mary goes every day to the tomb. And the chief priests, having summoned the guards set by them not to allow anyone to pray at the holy sepulchre, inquired about her whether in truth it was so. And the guards answered and said that they had, had seen no such thing, God having not allowed them to see her when there. And on one of the days, it being the preparation, Holy Mary, as was her wont, came to the sepulchre. And while she was praying, it came to pass that the heavens were opened. And the archangel Gabriel came down to her and said, Hail, you that brought forth Christ our God, your prayer having come to the heavens to him who was born of you has been accepted. And from this time, according to your request, you shall go to the heavenly places to your son into the true and everlasting life. And having heard this from the holy archangel, she returned to her home, having along with her three virgins who ministered unto her. And after having rested a short time, she sat up and said to the virgins, Bring me a censer that I may pray. And they brought it as they had been commanded. And she prayed, saying, My Lord Jesus Christ, who deigned through your supreme goodness to be born of me, hear my voice and send me your apostle John, in order that seeing him I may partake of joy. And send me also the rest of your apostles, both those who have already gone to you and those in the world that now is, in whatever country they may be, through your holy commandment, in order that having beheld them, I may bless your name much to be praised, for I am confident that you hear your servant in everything. And while she was praying, I, John, came, the Holy Spirit having snatched me up by a cloud from Ephesus, and set me in the place where the mother of my Lord was lying. And having gone beside her and glorified him who had been born of her, I said, Hail, mother of my Lord, who brought forth Christ our God. Rejoice that in great glory you are going out of this life. And the Holy Mother of God glorified God because I, John, had come to her, remembering the voice of the Lord, saying, Behold your mother, and behold your son, John, I. And the three virgins came and worshipped, and the Holy Mother of God said to me, Pray and cast incense. And I prayed thus, Lord Jesus Christ, who has done wonderful things, now also do wonderful things before her who brought you forth, and let your mother depart from this life. Let those who crucified you and who have not believed in you be confounded. And after I had ended the prayer, Holy Mary said to me, Bring me the censer. And having cast incense, she said, Glory to you, my God and my Lord, because there has been fulfilled in me whatsoever you promised to me before you ascended into heaven, that when I should depart from this world, you would come to me and the multitude of your angels with glory. And I, John, said to her, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God, is coming, and you see him as he promised to you. And the Holy Mother of God answered and said to me, The Jews have sworn that after I have died they will burn my body. And I answered and said to her, Your holy and precious body will by no means see corruption. And she answered and said to me, Bring a censer and cast incense and pray. And there came a voice out of the heavens saying, The Amen. And I, John, heard this voice, and the Holy Spirit said to me, This voice which you heard denotes that the appearance of your brethren, the apostles, is at hand, and of the holy powers that they are coming hither today. And the Holy Spirit said to the apostles, Let all of you gather together, having come by the clouds from the ends of the earth. Here in the Latin text, it says that Thomas was not with them. And after all these things had come to pass through the mother of God and ever-Virgin Mary, the mother of the Lord, while we the apostles were with her in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit said to us, You know that on the Lord's day the good news was brought to the Virgin Mary by the archangel Gabriel. And on the Lord's day the Savior was born in Bethlehem. And on the Lord's day the children of Jerusalem came forth with palm branches to meet Him, saying, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord. 
And on the Lord's day He rose from the dead. And on the Lord's day He will come to judge the living and the dead. And on the Lord's day He will come out of heaven to the glory and honor of the departure of the holy glorious virgin who brought Him forth. And on the same Lord's day, the mother of the Lord said to the apostles, Cast incense, because Christ is coming with a host of angels. And behold, Christ is at hand, sitting on a throne of cherubim. And while we were all praying, there appeared innumerable multitudes of angels. And the Lord mounted upon the cherubim in great power. And behold, a stream of light coming to the Holy Virgin, because of the presence of her only begotten Son. And with all the powers of the heavens fell down and adored Him. And the Lord, speaking to his mother, said, Mary. And she answered and said, Here am I, Lord. And the Lord said to her, Grieve not, but let your heart rejoice and be glad, for you have found grace to behold the glory given to me by my Father. And the Holy Mother of God looked up and saw him in a glory which is impossible for the mouth of man to speak of or to apprehend. And the Lord remained beside her, saying, Behold, from the present time, your precious body will be transferred to paradise and your holy soul to heaven, to the treasures of my Father, in exceeding brightness, where there is peace and joy of the holy angels, and other things besides. And the mother of the Lord answered and said to him, Lay your right hand upon me, O Lord, and bless me. And the Lord stretched forth his undefiled right hand and blessed her. The Lord said to his mother, Let your heart rejoice and be glad, for every favor and every gift has been given to you from my Father in heaven, and from me, and from the Holy Spirit, every soul that calls upon your name shall not be ashamed, but shall find mercy and comfort and support and confidence, both in the world that is now is and in that which is to come, in the presence of my Father in heaven. And the Lord turned and said to Peter, The time has come to begin the singing of the hymn. And Peter, having begun the singing of the hymn, all the powers of heaven responded with the Alleluia. And then the face of the Mother of God shone brighter than light, And she rose up and blessed each of the apostles with her own hand. Remember that text that her face shone brighter than light. I'm going to show you on a slide in a few minutes a rendition of that. And she rose up and blessed each of the apostles with her own hand. And all gave glory to God. And the Lord stretched forth His undefiled hand and received her holy and blameless soul. And with the departure of her blameless soul, the place was filled with perfume and ineffable light. And behold, a voice out of the heavens was heard, saying, Blessed are you among women. And Peter and I, John, and Paul and Thomas ran and wrapped up her precious feet with the consecration. And the twelve apostles put her precious and holy body on a couch and carried it. And behold, while they were carrying her a certain... And here's the... We're going to skip this for time, okay? But when you guys read this, this is the story of Thomas coming. So we're going to skip down to a well-born Hebrew, Jephonius by name. You see that? We're skipping all the italicized stuff. You can go back and read it later. Running against the body, put his hands upon the couch, and behold, an angel of the Lord by invisible power with a sword of fire cut off his two hands from his shoulders and made them hang upon the couch, lifted up in the air. And at this miracle, which had come to pass, all the people of the Jews who beheld it cried out, Verily, He that was brought forth by you is the true God, O Mother of God, ever Virgin Mary. And Jephonius himself, when Peter ordered him that the wonderful thing of God might be showed forth, stood up behind the couch and cried out, Holy Mary, who brought forth Christ to his God, have mercy upon me. And Peter turned and said to him, In the name of him who was born of her, your hands which have been taken away from you will be fixed on again. And immediately at the word of Peter, the hands hanging by the couch of the lady came and were fixed on Jephonius. And he believed and glorified Christ who had been born of her. And when this miracle had been done, the apostles carried the couch and laid down her precious and holy body in Gethsemane in a new tomb. And behold, a perfume of sweet savor came forth out of the holy sepulcher of Our Lady, the Mother of God, And for three days the voices of invisible angels were heard glorifying Christ, our God, who had been born of her. Again, the Latin text, which is regarding Thomas. You can read that on your own, okay? For sake of time. I'd hope to share that with you. It's kind of, it's really neat. And when the third day was ended, the voices were no longer heard. And from that time forth, all knew that her spotless and precious body had been transferred to paradise. And after it had been transferred, behold, we saw Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Baptist, and Anna, the mother of the lady, 
and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David singing the Alleluia and all the choirs of the saints adoring the holy relics of the mother of the Lord and the place full of light than which light nothing could be more brilliant and an abundance of perfume in that place to which her precious and holy body had been transferred in paradise and the melody of those praising him who had been born of her sweet melody of which there cannot be enough such as is given to virgins and them only to hear. We apostles, therefore, having beheld the sudden precious translation of her holy body, glorified God who had shown us his wonders at the departure of the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose prayers and good offices may we all be deemed worthy to receive under her shelter and support and protection, both in the world that now is and in that which is to come, glorifying every time and place her only begotten Son, along with the Father and the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. I will conclude with two very different perspectives on the Mother of God. The first is from an enemy of the church who enjoys writing comics about what we believe. He says, central is their Virgin Mary, who has been elevated by papal decree to the status of a goddess. Nothing in the Bible suggests that the biblical Mary is anything else but a devout, ordinary Jewish woman. Rome has transformed her into a sinless, celestial being. This is sheer blasphemy making her equal to Jesus in the minds of hundreds of millions of Roman Catholics around the world. In fact, Jesus has been reduced to a wheat wafer in the Eucharist, and the practical focus of their worship is now upon Mary, Queen of Heaven, rather than on Jesus as King and Savior. How do you like that? It's a man named Jack Chick. Jack Chick. Yeah, you can hiss. St. John Damascene. Even though according to nature your most holy and happy soul is separated from your most blessed and stainless body and the body as usual is delivered to the tomb, it will not remain in the power of death and is not subject to decay. For just as her virginity remained inviolate while giving birth, when she departed her body was preserved from destruction and only taken to a better and more divine tabernacle, which is not subject to any death. Hence, I will call her holy, passing not death, but falling asleep or departure, or better still, arrival. Your stainless and holy immaculate body has not been left on earth. The queen, the mistress, the mother of God, who has truly given birth to God, has been translated to the royal palaces of heaven. Angels and archangels have borne you upwards. The impure spirits of the air have trembled at your ascension. The air is purified and either sanctified by your passing through them. The powers meet you with sacred hymns and much solemnity, saying something like this. Who is she that comes forth as the morning rising, fair as the moon, elect like the sun? How you have blossomed forth, how sweet you have become. You are the flower of the field, a lily among the thorns. Not like Elijah have you entered heaven, nor like Paul have you been wrapped in the third heaven. No, you have penetrated even to the royal throne of your son himself. A blessing for the world, a sanctification of the universe, refreshment for those who are tired, comfort for the sorrowing, healing for the sick, a port for those in danger, pardon for sinners, soothing balm for the oppressed, Quick help for all who pray to you. Good mistress, graciously look down on us. Direct and guide our destinies wheresoever you will. Pacify the storm of our wicked passions. Guide us into the quiet port of divine will and grant us the blessedness to come. Amen. In conclusion, only because I skipped this part in my talk and I think you guys will enjoy it and I think I have about two minutes I have some slides for you to see the place in Jerusalem traditionally associated with the falling asleep of the mother of God. Well, there's Jerusalem. That's beautiful, huh? Yeah. This is the Kidron Valley, 
The Mount of Olives is right here. Mount Sion is here, the highest point of Jerusalem. You remember, in the church, we oftentimes talk of the daughter of Zion, right? You've heard that before, yes? The daughter of Sion. Why do we talk about the daughter of Sion? Because during the Babylonian exile, the poorest of the poor were left in the land while everyone else was taken away in exile. Those poorest of the poor, the farmers, went to Mount Sion. They were the faithful daughter of God. Mary, and by extension the church, is also called the daughter of Sion, who remains faithful while the outside world attacks. You remember this spot, because I'm going to show you pictures of the church there. They would have taken her body, most likely, down into this, across the city. Well, this would have been on the outside at that point, And up the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives area, where tradition tells us that Joachim and Anne, who were her parents, were also buried. And who else was buried there? St. Joseph. It was a family tomb in Gethsemane. You want to know why Jesus liked to go and pray in Gethsemane? Uh, there's Jerusalem panoramic view. Looking from the Mount of Olives, here's the, uh, all the tombs on the Mount of Olives on the east side of Jerusalem because the tradition that the glory cloud of God at the Babylonian exile left Jerusalem towards the east. And so everyone's buried there because they know that when the glory of God comes back, He's going to come from the east. Well, guess what? Who is the glory of God? Jesus. And guess where Jesus came into Jerusalem for his enthronement upon the cross? Right down this hill. This over here is Mount Sion. There is Mount Sion, and there is the Dormition Abbey, the Roman Catholic Church of the Dormition Abbey, where tradition tells us that the mother of God fell asleep. And here's the inside of the upper church. Very beautiful. And then you go downstairs to the place where the mother of God died or fell asleep. And here is a statue as she's laying down. You see her face is bright white. Her hands are bright white. Remember? The shining light. Her face became radiant. And you'll notice up here is a mosaic of Christ and seven women of the Old Testament all enthroned around Christ. Who are these women? You tell me. There you go. Eve. Who's that? Miriam, the the sister of? Moses. Remember the Egyptians being buried in the Red Sea and then she praises the Lord? Okay, who is it? Ruth. Ruth. Faithful to the Lord and faithful to Naomi. All images of the mother of God. Who is it? Jael, who took the tent peg through the skull of Sisera, the enemy of the people of God, and killed him. Defender against the enemies of God. Who is it? Judith, Judith, holding the head of? Holofernes, right? She chopped off his head and saved the people of God. All of these women conquered the enemies of God. They were powerful over death. Who is it? Esther. Esther, again, this image of faithfulness in the face of attack. Okay, and there's the mother of God. Her body is laying there, is a carving of this icon. Okay, you see the icon, I'll go backwards, see that? And you'll notice, here's Christ holding her soul. Remember the story tells us that her soul and body were separated, right? Taken into heaven, and her body was then laid in the tomb, and three days later was then translated into paradise. Now, in the Kidron Valley is the tomb traditionally associated with the burial of the Mother of God. It's still open. You can go there today. You go down, I think it's 38 steps, is that correct? Down into a cave, way down under the earth. And there along the sides is the tomb of St. Joseph. I think Joachim and Anne on this side and St. Joseph on that side. Am I correct? You go down these steps into the cave, and it's a little hard to see, but here's an altar and a doorway. There's the doorway, and you go inside, and there's the stone upon which the body of Mary was laid. There it is again. And then finally, the icon of the mother of God. I'll leave you with this thought. God loves us, and what he did for the mother of God was not to be left there. When Jesus ascended into heaven, there's no great mystery that the Son of God 
was enthroned at the right hand of the Father. Well, the mystery is that he took our human nature and entered it into the divine presence. He enthroned us, the sons of God, at the right hand of the Father. He loves us and wants to make us partakers of the divine nature, as St. Peter says. Really partakers of the divine nature. He wants to share his life with us that we might live with him forever, not floating around in outer space, but with our bodies so that we can see him and we can hold the hand of Jesus and hold the hand of Mary and talk to them face to face. That's what he made our bodies for. And that is exactly what he's going to do with us if we remain faithful to him as the mother of God remained faithful. Thank you very much. Deacon, would you please talk a little bit about uh, Psalm 132, and particularly verse 8 and verses 13 and on, where there is such a a very strong prophecy of not just Christ's ascension, but the assumption. Mm Mm-hmm. Take a look at at Psalm 132. I had to skip this. There's also a reference in your Bible there, Susie, to Sirach. What is that? Sirach what? Sirach 24. Sirach 24. You guys can write that down also. These are classic references used liturgically also in reference to the assumption of the mother of God. Obviously, this isn't going to give us too far apologetically. However, for those that are um, not interested in simple apologetics, but actually diving a little bit deeper into the text and the mystery here, these are beautiful texts. Psalm 132, verse 8 and verse 13. Verse 8, Arise, O Lord, and go to thy resting place, thou and the ark of thy might. And then verse 13, For the Lord has chosen Sion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. Now, first of all, always remember when you're reading Scripture, you want to first understand the historical context in which something is written. Only then are you going to really be able to apply it typologically to further events. What do I mean typologically? Simply this, that God has done things in the past that he does again and again. It is the same God. It's we who change, not him. So when God enters into human history, oftentimes we see a repetition of events. It's God's love manifesting itself all the time, constantly, constantly manifesting itself. And so events in salvation history are oftentimes repetition over and over again, the same story, right? You've got the creation story with water and and life coming out of it, and then you've got the Ark of the Covenant and man coming out of the Ark through the water. You have Moses and Israel coming through the Red Sea. All of these things are types of baptism, okay? Not just, oh, it's kind of like that. No, it really is the same mystery being revealed of God's love saving mankind. And here also in the Psalms, Arise and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your covenant. Why does Susie point this out to us? Because Mary is traditionally called the ark of the new covenant. Why do we call Mary the ark of the new covenant? Because the ark of the old covenant contained the things of God. The ark of the new covenant contains God himself. And she remains the ark of the covenant. Move to Revelation chapter 11, keeping your hand over there in Psalms. Revelation chapter 11, verse 19. Now, before I say anything, remember, these verses and chapter breaks are a late edition. This is not part of the original text, right? John wasn't writing, putting in numbers. It's a late edition to the text. So you have to read a text through. Whenever you do a chapter break, don't stop. Because a lot of times, the editor that put this in, put it in a bad spot. And this is a classic example. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, loud noises, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavenly hail. And a great portent, a sign, appeared in the heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was with child. I said you have to read them together because John looks into heaven and he says, I see the Ark of the Covenant. I see a woman clothed with the sun. She's with child. Okay? What is he seeing? 
He's not seeing the old Ark of the Covenant, which was hidden by Jeremiah and lost. She's seen the fullness of what that piece of wood pointed to. Remember, Jesus Christ has come to take out of our hearts a heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh. What was wood and metal and stone in the Old Testament becomes flesh in the New. What was written on stone is incarnate in the Word of God. What was built out of wood in the ark is now revealed in man. Why? Because God loves us. Ultimately, he wants to give his, the fullness of his life to us, not to a piece of wood. Well, a piece of wood's good, and eventually a piece of wood. Ultimately, yes, to us. And so Mary is the ark of the covenant. And you say, well, deacon, stop here. That's going too far. Well, if you've got a problem with me saying that, you've got a problem with the Gospel of Luke. Because in the Gospel of Luke... Mary is depicted as the Ark of the Covenant. You need to go and listen to my talk that I did on the visitation. You can get on our website and listen to that. When the Ark of the Covenant was taken up into Jerusalem, David danced before it. Who danced before Mary? John the Baptist. Mary went to visit Elizabeth in the hill country of Judah. The Ark was taken into the hill country of Judah. When it was taken to the hill country of Judah, it was taken to the home of a Hittite man, and his house was blessed. It became fruitful. When Mary visited Elizabeth, the baby room left for joy. She became fruitful. So all of these images, Luke intentionally depicting Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. This is not a late theological idea that developed in the church. This is something in the first century to see Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, And finally, back in Psalm 130, oh boy, I'm really breaking my own rule. It's supposed to be like a minute, right? <laughs> Psalm 132, verse 13, the Lord has chosen Sion. Now, realize that Sion is used as the name for all of Jerusalem because it's the high point of the city. It's the pinnacle. It's the best. And so it's used as a name for all of the city. So historically, this text was written about the ascension of the ark into Jerusalem, the taking of the ark into Jerusalem, right? But notice the point about Sion. And Mary goes up to Sion, and there she dies. And not by accident. All of these things are by the design of God, and beautifully by the design of God. I'm told it used to be a common Christian epitaph to say, awaiting the redemption of his body, or awaiting the redemption of her body which has kind of fallen into disuse. I wonder if you might comment on that in light of your talk tonight. I, I, well, I haven't heard that, but I'll tell you what, it's about time we bring it back. Because I could get in a conversation with so many Catholics and say, so explain to me. My brother does it. He loves to do this with people. So talk to me about the end of your life. What's going to happen? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. Okay, and then what's going to happen? Well, I hope I'm going to go to purgatory. If you hope you're going to go to purgatory, my friends, no, you hope you're going to go to heaven. All right? You hope you're going to go to heaven. So, and then what? Well, after, you know, 500 years of suffering and, and vengeance, I'm going to hopefully be able to join the angelic choir. And there I'm going to sing. You, you know, I, why not? Yeah, we'll all sing in heaven. Even we have a bad voice. Everybody get a good voice. Everybody's going to sing for all eternity. Okay? And then what? Well, that, we're just going to sing. I'm, I'm going to look at Jesus and we're going to sing. And then what? What do you mean? They missed the entire point about the resurrection of the body. The resurrection of the body is a fundamental teaching of the church. Fundamental. If you ever think about what heaven's going to be like, think about it with your body. Then you'll have some things to think about. You know? Oh, that's going to be pretty awesome. I'm going to be able to, like Jesus, you know, walk through things and at the same time lean against them if I want. Right? The whole of the... Yeah! Jesus ate, and he walked through walls, didn't he? Yeah. And if he wanted to, he could have leaned against the same wall he just walked through, because all of the created order becomes subject to the sons of God. All of the created order becomes at his will. This is why Jesus walked on water, okay? The entire creator was subject to him, and it was his will which dictated what it did. He walked on it because he needed to walk on it at that moment. He walked through a wall because they had locked the stupid door. <laughs> All right? 
never lock a door when a Jehovah's Witness comes into the... Because you never know who's knocking, okay? You think it's Jehovah's Witness, it might be Jesus. <laughs> All right. Anyways. <laughs> All right, I'm having fun. Okay. We have an internet question here from Bridget Halesmeyer from Falls Church, Virginia. It says, the Blessed Virgin Mary was nearest to Christ in his humanity because he received his human nature from her. And we know from science, the last decade or so has told us that mothers uh, carry stem cells mm -hmm. of their children within their bodies for the rest of their life. Can you comment on that? <laughs> no, I'm not a scientist or a doctor. But yes, I've heard this also. So she remains the Ark of the Covenant because the fact that you, the mother remains really intimately connected, right? Literally, part of her child's body is in her. And so she literally remains the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, yeah. But let me go one step further. That's a great finding and really helpful to our cause. But you know what? We need, I think, in, in conversations with those who have a problem with the mother of God, we need to go back and talk to them about God's love. Because all of the logical arguments fall short. I have had so many logical arguments. I'm sure you've had this. I lay out the exact teaching of the church, logically. Defend it from Scripture to the hilt. And at the end of the day, the person walks away. We have to start talking to people about the fundamentals of our faith and the most fundamentals of our faith, which is that God loves us and he wants to share his life with us. He doesn't hate us. He doesn't want to see us dead. He wants to see us alive. Every teaching of the church should be begun with that point when you're talking to someone that doesn't share our faith. Do you believe that God loves you? Well, yes, of course I do. Great. Now we can begin to talk about why bread can become the flesh of God why water can give life and baptism, why it's possible for a human being to be assumed into heaven itself. We can talk about all the, why it's possible for a man to say words of absolution and your sins are forgiven. That's only proper to God alone. Yes, you're right, it is. And it's God's gift to love us. So what is found in God alone is now found among men because God loves us. And we can begin to talk to people about our faith that way instead of banging them over the head with Bible verses. All those Bible verses I gave you earlier today are going to get you nowhere in a discussion because they've heard them all before. Okay? All right. Yes, Monica has a question. While I'm running there, I just want to let you know we had an email from Trinidad. Oh, Trinidad. Yes, all from right. Hayden. And he says, thank you for the work you're doing. You have provided me a wealth of information through the grace of God. I have grown in faith and have been able to share with others, Catholic and non-Catholic. Again, I thank God for you, and may he continue to bless your, his work. Wonderful. <laughs> Can I, I just want to say that to that, I hope you're still watching, because there is like this enclave of institute people in Trinidad. Uh -huh. And I don't know who you are. But I know you're watching because I watch our website. I see where people come from. See that? We're tracking you. Anyways, <laughs> I, wa <laughs> I want to know what's going on in Trinidad. There's all these Trinidad people. So please let send me an email so I know you guys got a group together or something because I see all these hits to our website. Yes. Can you speak more about the argument you talked about where Mary died in Jerusalem versus Ephesus? Can you talk more about the history of that and the arguments? Let me read you from the Dolores Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ by Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. She says, After our Lord lived for three years on Mount Sion, Jerusalem, for three years in Bethany, and for nine years in Ephesus, to which St. John took her, after the Jews had set Lazarus and his sisters adrift upon the sea, Mary did not live in Ephesus itself, but in the country near it, where several women who were her close friends had settled. Mary's dwelling was on a hill to the left of the road from Jerusalem, some three and a half hours from Ephesus, John had a house built there for the Blessed Virgin before he brought her there. And then she goes on to talk about Mary's death there in Ephesus. Again, this is a vision that she received while she was on, really on her deathbed. She was sick for 12 years in bed. She began to have these visions. And there was a, I believe it was a German poet that found out, went to her bedside and wrote down her visions. And you can read them now. And some people read them and they go crazy. Wow, this is like you know, the new gospel. Well, there's nothing wrong with Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich. And I have no problem with people saying that Mary went and lived in Ephesus. In fact, there's a church there, one of the earliest churches, if not the earliest church, dedicated to the Mother of God there in Ephesus. 
And so most likely, I would say, Mary did go to Ephesus. However, the idea that she died in Ephesus is something that is completely foreign to the Christian tradition, Catholic and Orthodox, up until the 19th century. So it's really hard to defend that when you have a tradition going back, written tradition, to the 3rd and 4th centuries. A written tradition of the 3rd and 4th centuries. That's pretty darn early. And again, a written tradition is usually based upon an oral tradition. Now, I want to say one last thing also about the text I read to you. You'll see that oftentimes listed in text as the apocryphal story of St. John's, whatever it's called, okay? The reason it's called apocryphal, we're a little bit allergic as Catholics to that word because of, what's the guy's name, Dan Brown? Yeah. Well, he abused the tradition of the church. Yes, there are writings of the early church which are not to be trusted, which were written by the heretics as a defense of their position against orthodoxy. However, there are a lot of other texts which are written which are also called apocryphal works as a general term. And the general idea is that, first of all, was it written by the person it was claimed to be written by? No. This says St. John. St. John wasn't alive in the 6th century. So it was attributed to him, but it wasn't written by St. John the Evangelist, okay, or the Beloved. Here we are, St. John the Beloved. It wasn't written by him. Are there sometimes fanciful aspects to the text, which may be rooted in truth, but may have developed over time into more fanciful things, okay? Like this two stories, the two different traditions about that man touching the, uh, the couch that Our Lady was laying on, that his arms shriveled, dried up. Okay, and the other one said the angel cut him off. Well, here's what I would say, is that, look, this text comes to us as the tradition of the church. There probably was a guy that ran up and tried to tip her thing over, okay? And he probably was struck down for it. How exactly it happened it was written down differently or came across to us differently. So, you know, these texts are, they're non-canonical. They're not inspired by God. They're still beautiful historical texts. Do you know that the Proto-Evangelium of St. James is the place where we find out that the name of Mary's parents were Joachim and Anne. And they're in our liturgy from the proto of St. James, apocryphal work. So don't, please don't apply apocryphal like bad to all of the texts which are non-canonical. It's not, it's not what should be done. All right, what else? Any other questions? In this last paragraph here, it says, And after it had been transferred, behold... We saw Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Baptist, and Anna, the mother of the lady, and Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and David singing the Alleluia. How did they see them if they didn't have their bodies there? Oh, well, that's, that's, a, hey, that's a great question. I'm shooting from the hip here, okay? But oftentimes, even the angels will appear bodily by the gift of God so that we are able to see them. Gabriel, right? The Archangel Gabriel appears to Mary. She saw him. Okay? Uh, exactly what that looks like, I don't know. It must be a pretty far out thing to see an angel. But even on Transfiguration, even though they had their bodies, how that exactly was revealed to them, I don't know. But I have no problem with that. The, the saints have appeared to the church throughout her history. Okay? And so God provides the gift of whatever kind of body that is, I don't know. For us, for our sake. All right, I think that's more than enough. I'll finish with the text which was sung in my church last night. I was standing there at the canter stand, and lo and behold, this was sung. And it's, it's very, I won't sing it, I'll just read it to you to spare you the suffering. <laughs> Remember, lex orande, lex credende. The law of prayer is the law of belief in both the East and the West. We listen to what we pray and we know what to believe. O ye apostles from afar, being now gathered together here in the valley of Gethsemane, give burial to my body, and thou, my Son and my God, receive thou my spirit. Amen. Thank you very much. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7123.
555. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.